Shalom. God bless you. Everyone that is watching from whatever part of the world you're watching, the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for just creating some time to be able to watch over this particular message that I'm about to share. And I believe that God is going to bless you and this message is going to transform your life. And of course, keep inspired as a child of God. Even those that are born again, of course, we always want to simply extend this love of God and this grace towards you as well, that even as you happen to get a chance to be able to hear listen to this message, my prayer is that the Lord will be able to save you by His grace, because at the end of the day, we are all products of His grace. And if we accept this grace that Jesus Christ came loaded with, and then pay the price and the cost of Calvary for the sake of my sins and your sins, I believe you'll be able to receive the eternal life and you will not be able to face the end time judgment that is meant to send them that repel against the Lord to hell. So please welcome. Let us keep on enjoying God's word and see our best God but to minister to us by spirit and simply change our lives and give us profound understanding as regarding his word <clears throat> now we there is something I want to simply put across as believers uh, God has given us prophetic promises through the person of Christ and indeed the Bible says Paul rise and says that all the promises of God are yes and amen in the book of Corinthians and of course this is quite encouraging but I want to also make you understand that provided that we are on this planet Earth and as much as we have the good part of enjoying the premises of God, but at the same time, there are also challenges. The enemy is also charging against believers day in and day out. And what is he looking for? He wants to find the one I can be able to simply um, probably diffuse our belief and our faith in the Lord. And therefore, this particular hour, I want to speak about the test of our faith. This has nothing to do with whether you have the material blessings. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. We are all bound to face this subject of the taste of faith and by the grace of God I'm going to go through the scriptures and flip some Bible readings and be able to look at you know how different types of believers or several believers and what they're able to encounter as the trial of their faith you know and this is very key this is very important I'm also in this last days I just shared a message a couple of days ago about some will turn away from their faith it's on YouTube, you can be able to check on our channel, you can be able to simply get blessed from this particular message. But then, this particular moment, I want to speak about the test of our faith. And I want to simply help us understand why it's very important for us to understand that we'll be able to go through the test of time. The test majorly, of course, as regarding to our faith. Now. We are going to extract our message from the book of First Peter. Peter was the frontliners of the disciples of Christ. Christ called him to ministry when he was doing fishing alongside his fellow and ministers. Of course, who later became ministers. They were fishermen, of course. Others were doing different kind of work. Not all the disciples were fishermen, all the same. And we do understand their biography. You know, before they were called into ministry. Now, this was uh, the first epistles of Apostle Peter, which, of course, he wrote. He says in verse number one, Peter, an apostle, special messenger of Jesus Christ, writing to the elect exiles of dispassion scattered so the broad in Pontus Galatia uh, Cappadocia 
ancient Bithynia. So he's addressing these believers in these localities, in these particular regions. And we we'll want to be able to look at why was he writing this, but we'll get to this later, of course. Who were chosen and foreknown by God the Father and consecrated, sanctified, made holy by the Spirit to be bidden to Jesus Christ the Messiah to be sprinkled with his blood? May great spiritual blessing and peace be given you, uh, given you in increasing abundant that spiritual peace to be realized in through Christ freedom from fears, agita agitating passions, moral conflicts. Praise, honored, blessed be the God of uh, God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. His boundless mercy, we have been born again to an ever living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Born anew into an inheritance which is beyond reach of change, decay, imperishable, and fading, reserved in heaven for you. Who are being guided and garrisoned by God's power through your faith. Please take note of that. Through your faith, till you fully inherit the final salvation that is ready to be revealed for you in the last time. Verse 6, which is going to be the subject of focus throughout our study. You should be exceedingly glad on this account, though now, for a little while, you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. Uh, and verse 7 as well, we are going to enjoy the two so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold which is tested, purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise, glory and honor when just the Messiah, the anointed one, is revealed actually the dominant subject of focus is not verse number six. Verse six is going just to give us an entry to verse number seven, which is now where our subject is of focus, the test of our faith, not the way I had indicated previously, that is verse number six, it's verse number seven. Then verse eight says, without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not even now see him, you believe in him, exalt, thrill with expressible, glorious, triumphant, heavenly joy. At the same time, you receive the result, outcome, consummation of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, the prophets who prophesied the grace, divine blessing, which was intended for you, such and inquired earnestly about the salvation. Verse 11, they sought to find out to whom or when this was to come, which the Spirit of Christ working within them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow them. Now, of course, I've read uh, other additional scriptures. However, I would want us to simply remain focused on the main subject, which, of course, is, as I said again, is basically on within number seven, or it's actually the verse number seven about the test of our faith. Now, there are several things that I want us to look at and be able to simply ask ourselves as believers. I said again earlier on as I began, that salvation has two faces. Faces in which way? The number one face is, regardless of what may be happening in our lives, we remain true and obedient to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is to say, our salvation, our trust and believing our Lord and Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, is not pegged largely on what He is able to do in our lives materially. No. This is to say that whether the material blessing is there, and this is not to say that I don't, you know, acknowledge the material blessing. I do. But again, 
we ought to be very cautious in the sense that our salvation is not just pecked on these things because it's pecked on these things the moment the Lord simply experiences them will begin to simply doubt or begin to turn down even where faith is concerned this faith has to remain subject to Christ and Christ alone now I want us to simply look at why Peter was able to write this first and foremost look at when and where it was written that's very important for us to be able to establish now this was the first episode of Apostle Peter it is believed that it's normally said according to the Bible scholars and researchers and the historians brother probably if I may put it so that Apostle Peter was able to write this particular episode of course between uh, 62 AD 6 to 64 and 67 AD between those particular years he wrote from Babylon according to first Peter 5 13 according to 5 Peter first Peter 5 13 maybe I can just simply be able to show you He writes and says, She, your sister church here in Babylon, who is a lect chosen with yourself, sends you greetings. So does my son, disciple Mark. This is just to confirm to you, of course, from where Peter's writing, but prob probably, as it's only said by the historians or Bible scholars, that this was probably uh, just uh, symbolic that Babylon was symbolic or rather euphemism, uh, euphemism for Rome euphemism for Rome it generally accepted that Peter uh, this is important you know like in those days it is believed that Babylon was of course in other words looked as you know Rome you know another you know it was that's how they were just concluded but I'm going to explain even further as we proceed um, it is generally accepted that Peter died during the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. Now you see we had mentioned Babylon, but you come and realize that actually Peter was of course ministering during the days of the Emperor Nero. And that should be between of course again as I said um, 64 AD uh, when Nero began to persecute Christians traditionally it is said that Apostle Peter wrote the episode in Rome prior to his martyrdom which occurred around uh, 65 to 67 AD now according to the Bible historians it is normally say that 64 or rather 62 to 67 AD that's inclusive of 64 uh, that's okay that's, let me just put it from 62 to 64 AD 67 rather AD was the worst years of believers of that time it was like a dark age a dark moment a dark season for the believers of that time remember in verse number one Peter was addressing those particular brothers in those particular regions that were able to simply uh, highlight as we began reading verse number one you know we have uh, we have uh, that is Galatian we have uh, Cappadocia we have Pontus we have Asian we have Bethany these particular regions this is the kind of believers that he was addressing this believers but at the same time this is equally applicable to us in our time now to whom was it written and why we need to establish those two facts first we've been able to establish when and where it was written 62 to 67 AD or 62 to 64 AD and then of course it was of course 
in Babylon that of course it's totally said that that was symbolic it is meant to be in Rome reason why it was termed as Babylon well there were reasons probably that probably as we do more studies and research we're able to establish however we know very well that Peter was simply writing in uh, Rome during the leadership of Emperor Nero and I'm going to show you that shortly uh, Peter addressed this episode to the church members living in the five Roman provinces those particular regions or provinces Peter was able to address them in Asia Minor located the modern day Turkey the modern day Turkey Peter considered his readers to be elect of God and of course we know pretty well it's the same St. Peter that wrote that we are a chosen generation if you look at um, first Peter chapter 2 verse number 9 the spirit that was able to indicate that we are a chosen generation but again in the same same particular chapter 1 and uh, first Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2 he was able to indicate that who are chosen and who are known by God which is very true apostle Paul was able to indicate the same again in the book of Ephesians you know that you know of course he was able to we were the, the people that are born again were foreign. God for knew them. The same Paul has repeated in the book of Romans, chapter number, of course, 8, when you read from verse number 28, 29, all through, you'll discover that Paul speaks about for new, for new, you know. So, Peter's addressing these particular regions where these brethren were. And those regions were subject to Emperor Nero. Nero, rather. Uh, whichever you want to call him, Nero, Nero, whatever, you know. Likely, uh, okay, that, yeah, that's who we, here we are. He wrote to strengthen the saints in the trial of their faith. Uh, to prepare them for the future, very trial. Peter's message also taught them how to respond to persecutions whenever they come the way. Peter's counsel was very timely because the church members were about to enter a period of heightened persecution. He was simply putting this particular writing when before now the persecution began to come or play out loud until approximately uh, 64 AD about the time when Peter wrote this episode. The Roman government generally tolerated Christianity. That's to say that during that time, the Roman Empire, which was very powerful at that time, was able to simply tolerate Christianity to some extent. And then, of course, in July of that year, at 64 AD, a fire destroyed much of Rome. It was rumored that Emperor Nero himself ordered that the fire may be started in an effort to divert the blame in an effort to divert the blame for disaster some prominent Romans accused Christians of starting the fire the fire burned for almost six days 75 percent of the city was destroyed and this led to intense persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire this prompted most Christians to be killed in thousands during that period, including Apostle Peter and Apostle Paul. They died in Rome under Emperor Nero. Peter indicated that when the saints suffer as Christians, they can feel joy knowing that they are following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So this was simply wrote by Apostle Peter when the disciples or the believers were in the midst of persecutions. You know, I know from that particular time we have had persecutions of course across the nations of the world. There are nations that cannot simply embrace Christianity. There are nations we can talk about Jesus, we cannot talk about Jesus Christ. And nations that are open to the Lord Jesus Christ 
It's a blessing for so many believers. But as we get to the age of time, things are going to begin to change. That's why it's very important for us as a believer, for us as believers, that our relationship with God should not be based on what God is able to do. We shouldn't simply um, appear to be strong, dedicated, committed to God because of their blessings, materially, so to speak, that God has graciously allowed us to simply enjoy or have them. Because seasons are going to change. Moments are going to change. The world we live in, we're going to reach a place whereby it may even be very difficult probably to own something. And I'm going to simply uh, just a little bit to understand what I'm talking about like based on what has been going on you know for quite some time now you know we know that the enemy wants to simply say we can be able to establish his satanic kingdom across the nations of the world and see we can control the human race so if we attached to these things at some point Christ said why should a man gain the whole world he lose his own soul you know I always keep saying that hold the things of this life loosely, that when God demands them, or when challenges come, you're able to let them go. And please don't really get me wrong. I don't mean to say that having those blessings, it is wrong. No, it is a blessing. It's biblical. It's promised of God. But a moment will come when our faith has to simply be totally, uh, you know, trusted and tried you know yes we are believers not because they've done anything wrong no but that moment no these believers in these five regions of provinces they've not done nothing literally wrong they were just faithful believers and they're serving the lord of joy gladness and peter and paul appeared to be in those particular regions and when peter ended the first thing that he did in his episodes he began to address these people because he had foreseen whether it was prophetic leading the fact remains that he began to address these believers on chances of what may be able to befall them and he began to give them a background of their own lives and their own faith their own salvation in Christ Jesus and that's why when you look at verse Number two, who are chosen? He's making them to understand that you are chosen. You are a God's choice. You are God's chosen people. Just as he was able to help us understand in 1 Peter 2 9 that we are a chosen generation, a real priesthood, a holy nation. So that said by the Lord that we're able to show for the marvelous deeds of the Lord. You know. So, Peter is making them to understand that you are chosen. I remember Christ at some point in time to the disciples, I chose you. You didn't choose me. You and me have been chosen by the Lord. So this brethren were being reminded by Apostle Peter that you are chosen. You are chosen rather. And foreknown by God. Meaning, you are not a mistake before the Lord. The Lord knew you before you were even born. That's the way the Lord told Jeremiah. I knew you before you formed in your mother's womb. I knew you. I chose you. I called you into the prophetic responsibility. So, it's very important that we that are born again, no matter what may be happening in our lives, so he wanted them to understand. If we come to simply make them understand what they are going to go through. He first and foremost gives them a background of who they are. And that's why it's very important as believers. We got to learn to understand who we are from a godly perspective. He said, who are chosen? Who are chosen? Whom he foreknew. He was addressing them. That God chose you. God foreknew you. So, it is not an accident that you are where you are and you're serving God as you're serving. This is very, very important. Even for you and me 
We were chosen by the Lord. That's why you're born again. I'm born again. That's your servant, the Lord. And it's not of our own doing and our own making. He chose us among many. I know you can tell most of your friends are not born again. Your family members are not born again. But he chose you and chose me. Not because you're the best. No, he did that on the basis of his mercy and his love and his grace. So we must have that at the back of our minds. That we were children of the Lord. So Peter was making them to understand. For I knew by God the Father consecrated, sanctified, made them holy, by the spirit of obedience, by the spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. The Messiah, to the sprinkling with his blood, may great spiritual blessing, peace be given you increasingly, abundance, uh, increasing abundance, the spiritual peace to be realized in through Christ's freedom from fears, agit agitating passions, and moral conflicts. So, again, very interesting to know that he's praying for them that the peace of God may be given in increasing measure. This peace will be able to garrison themselves, gather from any form of fears or agitating passions of any kind of moral conflicts. So, he has told them they were chosen, they were found by the Lord. Then he comes and prays for them that let this particular, as they remain subject to Christ, as they remain obedient to Christ, that the peace of Christ may simply be increased in abundance in their lives to keep them away from fear and agitating persons in their lives. Then he says, Praise, honored, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, by his boundless mercy, you have been born again to an ever-living hope. Again, Peter comes further and simply says that we have been born again, or they were born again, and which this includes us as well. It also includes us that they've been born again to an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, first and foremost, he has made them to understand that God chose them, foreknew them. Then he goes further and says that for they were sanctified to remain subject to Christ in obedience. Then, of course, prays for them as regarding to peace. Then he comes and says, verse 3, Praise, honor, blessed be God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, by his boundless mercy. He simply established that our salvation is on the basis of God's mercy. Mercy is what simply saves us from God's judgment. So he says, our salvation, God decided to be merciful on earth. And his boundless mercy, his mercies, which Jeremiah says, they are new every morning. Peter Rice says this is the boundless mercies of God. They have no boundary. They have no limits. They have no measure. The mercies of God. That's why you and me, we are born again on the account of these mercies that have no limit or measure. So he was encouraging these brethren at the same time. You know, I want to put you in the picture, put myself in the picture, and put these brethren that are well then in the picture as well, because this letter was specifically being addressed to them. So it says, You've been born again to an ever living hope. A hope that is ever living. How? Through the resurrection of Christ, meaning Christ died, rose again, not to die again. Never. And the Bible says that if we believe in Him, even though we may die physically, we shall live again. Because in Christ, we don't die. In Christ, we sleep. You know, we sleep in Christ. We don't die. Paul has been able to indicate that in some of his letters in the book of Thessalonians. You know, so you and me as believers, the fact that Christ rose again, that by itself, he would say to like, 
he's asleep, she's asleep, you know. And therefore, Paul, his encouragement to this brethren and others as well, wrote and said, Now also we would, we would not have you ignorant that is not being missed, rather not being informed. Brethren, about those who fall asleep in death, that you may not grieve for them as the rest do, have no hope beyond the grave. That means we have two types of persons. Death is inevitable to every person. You know, at some point in time, if Christ, of course, takes more time to come, then of course, somehow along the line maybe, uh, he may take a number of people home. But the point is this. Paul says, we have two categories of persons that mourn. There are those who mourn for them that have died. As though them that, uh, uh, they, they mourn uh, as a people that have no hope beyond the grave. You know, the grave is the end of their hope. But for us here, he says, As the rest who do have no hope beyond the grave. This to say, the people that are not born again, their hope revolves around within, revolves within the atrium, and it ends in death. But you and me that are born again, look at what Paul is saying here. Since we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so, God will also bring with him, through Jesus, those who fall asleep in death. You see that? That's why Peter was able to simply help us to understand that, you know, we have been born again into an ever-living hope. So we have hope beyond the grave. We have hope beyond this life. Our hope is eternal. It's an ever-living. The word ever is timeless. It is endless. It is immeasurable. Verse number 15 says, of verse 11, chapter number 4, For this we declare to you by the Lord's own word, that we who are alive, and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way proceed, proceed into his persons or have an advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him. Listen, this is the only translation. Fallen asleep. Again, the emphasis, the consistency of the word fallen asleep in Christ. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with a shout of an angel, and with the blast of a trumpet, God, those who have fallen, have departed this life in Christ, will rise first. Now, you may be there not born again. Remember, the particular, the condition is very simple. Those who have departed in this life, in Christ, shall rise first. So the point is, Dying is there. People die on road accidents. People die, you know, sickness makes people die. But the point is, the Bible says, Blessed are they that die in the Lord. When you die this physical death, yet you are in Christ, then the Bible says, that The Lord, or that God Himself, when the trumpet shall sound, those who died in this life, departed this life in Christ, will rise first. Sometimes people they take these things for granted and they take this into likely. It is going to happen. One of these fine days, the church will be raptured. The dead shall hear the sound of the trumpet. Those who died in the Lord, those who fell asleep in Christ, and they shall rise. They then that are alive and they are in Christ. Look at what the Bible says, verse 17. Then we, the living ones, who remain on earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So all this through the eternities of eternities, we shall be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another 
with this word. So Paul has spoken about eternal security here that anyone that falls asleep in the Lord or dies in the Lord when the sound of the trumpet shall be heard then the dead who are in Christ shall rise first meaning if you don't die in the Lord in Christ Jesus you'll remain dead still awaiting for the day when judgment will be taking place and all the dead shall raise and face the judgment of the Lord. If you're not born again, don't contemplate, don't buy time, don't procrastinate. This is the time. You may have by just chance probably, you know, come across this message just by chance, maybe that's not your intention, but here you're hearing this particular point. Let the Lord take over your life. Allow Christ to take control of your life. Let him save you. Let him transform your life. Let him give you eternal life. It's very important. Now, this is for them that are not born again. And you that is born again, remain firm. We have hope that is ever living. We have hope beyond the grave. So to us, death is not anything. Death should not scare you. You are here for a purpose. You are here for an agenda. So these believers in the book of 1 Peter, we were just reading. We go back there again. In this particular reading, you know, so it says that we have been born again into an ever-living hope. Then he comes to verse number 5 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Who are being guarded, guarded only by God's power through your faith, till the fully, till you fully inherit the final salvation that is ready to be revealed for you in the last time. Remember, speaking these things, preparing them for what is about to take place under the leadership of Emperor Nero. He is equally there, so is Apostle Paul. He's there as well. He's an anointed man of God. They are greatly used by the Lord. So verse number 6, he comes and says, On the basis of what he has established, from verse number 2 up to verse number 5, he comes and tells them, Now on this account, you should be exceedingly glad on this account. Which account? Verse number 2, verse 3, verse 4, in verse 5, on this account, you should be not just glad. The Amplified says, you should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now, for a little while, you may be distressed by trial, trials. Not just trial, trials and suffer temptations. Now let me help us to understand something here. Peter has already established the fact that these believers, they know who they are. They've been made to understand what Christ did for them. You know, at what time did God know them? How God chose them? They've been born again into an ever-living hope. You know, they've been born again into an ever-living hope. Of course, talked about the inheritance which is beyond the rich or change, decay, that is verse number four, imperishable, you know, that of course you can even take time and read by yourself. But then on this account, verse two, three, four, and five, you should be exceedingly glad or rather exceedingly glad on this account, though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. Now, look at verse number seven, very interesting. First, verse 6 demands that we, you should be glad, exceeding glad. On this account that has been explained in verse number 2, 3, 4, and 5. So verse 6 says, you should be. You should be. You should be. Your state of being. Your attitude should be of that. It should be an attitude of gladness, of rejoicing on this account, on what I've been able to explain to you. So, when you look at what 
Paul has, rather Peter has been able to explain, it is more about eternal security, it's more about eternal life, ever living hope, inheritance that cannot simply see decay. We have been chosen of the Lord. So you don't see anything materially, material rather, being put across by Apostle Peter. Don't get me wrong. I didn't say that that was not about. Peter knew what was about to happen to them. And therefore, seasons determine what message we ought to share with the believers. There's a challenge to all of us as ministers. Seasons determine our Lord. Seasons will prompt us to simply listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because it's very important again for believers to be prepared both for the good and for the worst. Very important. But remember in this case talking about the text of our faith. So understanding seasons will equally help us to understand the mind of God and the message that the Lord wants us to share with the believers. It cannot just be like an anthem. There must be a different approach depending with the season and circumstances that are about to befall us. So, as I said again, Peter spoke all this because he had probably perceived in the spirit what the Lord had spoken him by spirit on what was about to happen in those five provinces that, you know, were under the emperor Nero. He was about to do something that was totally drastic. But because Peter understood what message to bring across, that is what he shared. Sometimes we overlook this yet. We are in season that will demand that sometimes we help believers to be prepared for any eventuality. Even as we speak about the blessings, the ordinary blessings that we are supposed to be received from the Lord. But it's also very important not to just prompt believers to be, uh, uh, how can I say, to be only focused on or inclined towards the blessings only as opposed to simply preparing equally for the worst that may come while we are within the earth realm. Sad to say, sad, sad to say, most believers are less prepared. That those were prepared, yes. But that those, not, that those were not prepared. And we are living at a time whereby those moments are about to show up again in this life that we are living in. The enemy is trying to mount up so many things that are meant to be used to simply frustrate the human race and more so the believers around the world. I know that those who are going through so many, many hardships around the world, we know they don't have the freedom of worship. They can't talk about the Lord in any way. If they do send their court, then their lives are cut short or they're in prison for years. But some of us are privileged in different parts of Africa and other parts of the world. We have the joy and the freedom of worship. So let's use that. Christ said, uh, I must work while it's still day. Night cometh where no one can do but work. Seasons will change with the time. But as for now, we have to take that advantage and simply equip ourselves for any form of angel that may simply befall us in the days ahead. Very, very important. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're awesome. You're wonderful. You're loving. I want to show a reading here.
First Chronicles 12, 32. First Chronicles 12, 32. The Bible says, And of Issachar, men who had understanding of times, to know what Israel ought to do. Among the twelve tribes of Israel, Issachar, there were persons that had the privilege of understanding the times and they were able to simply guide Israel what they're supposed to do. So even as his believers, Christ spoke about the end times. He spoke about the signs. He spoke about that are going to simply take place. And therefore it's very important that we align ourselves according to the time and the seasons that they are in as believers. Very, very important so that this can help believers not to be so preoccupied with the things of this life, but to be occupied with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because again, we are learning about the test of our faith. So we go back to First Peter. I'm, I'm doing all my best to give you a scripture that simply confirms some of the statements that I'm putting across by the grace of God. So first Peter chapter number one, already we have simply established verse number six, what attitude that they're supposed to simply exhibit. They're supposed to simply be a people that are full of gladness, full of joy in the midst of trials and temptations. They should instead not simply become bitter people, become easily, a people that become easily agitated, no. But instead they simply wear out these agitations or these fears by being glad or joyful. And then he gives the reason why it's important for them to be glad on the account of what he had explained earlier on. So, verse number says that so that now he comes and simply brings the object or the subject that is supposed to be focused in everything that he has explained so that the genuineness of your faith this is amplified the genuineness of your faith genuineness we know what the word genuine means meaning to say we have counterfeit we have counterfeit. As we know very well, we are living in a world whereby so many counterfeit products are being uh, brought into the market. Of course, in illegal ways. And people are really getting those products, yet they are not quite useful. They, are not, uh, they have no longevity. They cannot withstand pressure of any kind. But because we want the easy way, they don't want to also get the easy way, money the easy way, get easy things, yet somebody said cheap is very expensive. Which is true, but in this case I'm talking about stuff, I'm talking about faith. The genuineness of your faith. So that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith which is infinitely more precious than perishable gold. Which is tested and purified by fire. This proving your faith is intended to redound to your praise, glory, and honor when just the Messiah, the anointed one, is revealed now. Let's pause for a moment. Apostle Peter says, from verse number 6, you should be exceeding glad on this account. Verse 2, 3, 4, and 5 have explained. Then it comes as, so that. That means the attitude you simply display in verse 6 of being joyful it will simply confirm that you are a people that are ready to simply go through this moment of test 
and the test is about your faith your faith in the Lord your faith in Christ so the devil knows what to target remember again as I said they were just about to enter that dark moment they were just about to get into that season where Nero was going to simply make a decree that the believers may be persecuted and may be killed so Peter is trying to bring expect them to understand even when the worst happens your faith he says your faith which is more infinitely more precious listen so that the journeys of your faith may be tested your faith which is infinitely more precious than perishable gold gold is perishable according to the Lord yet when we take gold pure gold and place in fire the gold itself will only become purer and purer and purer if there are impurities attached to that gold they will be burned if the impurities that are holding on that gold they'll burn off but the gold itself will remain that's why sometimes our faith may be pegged on things other than Christ himself and sometimes when our faith is tested it is tested so that we can be able to find is this faith genuine is it a faith that is based on ulterior motives? Is it a faith that is based on what God can do or who God is? Is it a faith that simply says that I love God for who is irregardless in spite of what I may face today? Or is it a faith that if God doesn't do something, then my life is filled with vexation, with bitterness, with anguish why because I don't have what I expect now there's another realm of faith the faith which is of course validates our salvation and our relationship with the Lord this faith is what Peter was trying to put across because they were about to enter into a moment into a season of intense persecution so he wanted them to ensure that their faith is genuine their faith is fully subject to Christ. So I was encouraging them. That so that the journeys of faith. Now, you can't tell that this gold is pure until you test it by not just fire, but real fire. So you can imagine the analogy that Paul is using here. This is to say, it was to say, to say that actually, it's like, when he talks about the gold, this means that you might, he speaks about those trials in verse 6, but be glad, rejoice. Then he says, verse 7, keeps the intensity of the testing of gold. Then he says, this gold, which is perishable, yet your faith is more precious. You cannot match this faith with gold, yet gold is tested through fire. And you know very well, as I said again earlier on, when you put gold in the fire, only impurities that are attached to that gold will burn. But the gold will be more pure and pure and pure. Sometimes our faith has to be tested so that it can be known. Do we love God genuinely? Do we love God for who He is? Do we love God even when He doesn't bless me? Do bless us? Do we love Him? Do we love Him with blessings or no bless? Do we love Him with a job or no job? With a business or no business? With the money or no money? Do we love Him? So that moment will always come, and that's when our faith will be tested. Now, I'm not talking about this faith of just receiving things and miracles. No, I'm talking about the faith that simply validates our salvation in Christ Jesus. So that is what Paul, or rather Peter, was saying. He says, 
so that the journeys of your faith may be tested your faith which is infinitely more precious than perishable gold which is tested purified by fire this proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ the Messiah the anointed one is revealed now look at the days you're living in as a believer now look at how things are changing day by day I look at how the globalists I look at how the global elite are trying to simply do how what how much they do much they can to see how they can control humanity now it has been said over time that a time will come whereby we will all nothing but we shall be free how true that is it's a matter of time but then this is the point when the moment comes when the church will go through the seasons of challenges seasons those dark seasons even before the church erupted what I beg to ask is this you as a believer that is watching and listening are you willing to let your faith be tested tested to the extent that no matter what happens I won't let go I will not let go I remain true my allegiance to Christ and obedience to Christ will remain intact if there is anything that one should never by any chance lose is a salvation remember what I said last time about some will turn away from the faith now trials come to simply expose the genetic of our faith in our lives now you need to understand something very important here you know gold is admirable when you talk about world cup look at that gold that is normally you know being fought for that you, you can imagine that trophy is always pure gold you know the team that wins are always given that well and so you can imagine it's in fact when it's being taken around you know different countries it is protected that trophy and you can imagine Paul Peter says our faith is more precious supersedes it is superior over that gold that is tested by fire and Paul calls it perishable Peter rather calls it perishable yet it can stand the fire when it is tested he says that faith that we have supersedes that gold oh thank you Holy Spirit book of Luke 22 Christ was able to address Peter and he said Simon Simon Peter listen Satan has asked excessively that all of you be given up to him out of the power and keeping of God that he might sift to sift all of you like grain he was said to so listen carefully but I have prayed, especially for you, Peter, that your own faith may not fail. And when yourself have turned again, strengthen and establish your brethren. Christ addressed Peter said, Satan has been excessively asked. Hebrews 11 6 says, It's impossible to please God without faith he that comes to God must believe that God is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him without faith it is impossible 
to please God. You must believe that God is. That's to say, this faith helps them that God is and that God is there. Now, the enemy wants to always make sure that actually we doubt God or we relate with God based on what God is able to do in our lives. You know, in the other world, Satan always promises goodies. That's why he told Jesus Christ, worship me and I'll hand over all of these things to you if you just worship me. On the other hand, for us, everything is subject to God. Everything was created by the Lord. And therefore, we don't get motivated by these things which our Father owns. But the devil owns nothing. So the enemy will promise you goodies. But when it comes to us, we worship God because of who he is. We love him because of who he is. As our Father. Now, I want you to look at this. Holy Spirit. Nebuchadnezzar had made a decree that everybody within his empire should be able to worship the golden image, that particular statue that of course was representing him. Verse 12 of Daniel chapter 3, the Bible says, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this man or king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image. Then Amkadnezer in rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, these men were brought before the king. Then Amkadnezer said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods of worship, the golden image? Remember, they already had position, they had posts already, they were serving in the affairs of Babylon. And so they had already gotten positions. They were in a place of influence as well. But their worship was questionable. They were not subjecting their spiritual allegiance, the godly allegiance was not to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but was to God Almighty. So he said, Now, verse 15, if you are ready when you hear, uh, now if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, uh, trigon, and 
uh, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the, Im the image which I've made. Does it ring a bell that in Revelation 13 also John writes and simply says that a beast will be able to be erected and whoever will not be able to worship the beast will be definitely, their lives will be taken out. Everybody will be compelled from a global scale to worship that particular beast. I don't want to get into that, but it's there. A replication of what just took place during the days of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and even Daniel when they were in Babylon. This is about to play loud in this particular generation that we are in and the one that is to come if by any chance God gives us longevity or many more years ahead. Then it says, uh, every kind of music fall down and worship the image which I've made. Very good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast into the midst of burning fairy finance. Who is that God who can deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, O King Nebuchadnezzar, it is not necessary for us to answer you on this point. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fairy finance, he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Now listen at this particular man. Shadok mentioned Abednego. One, they are working in Babylon. They have their role of responsibility. Let me say maybe they're not payroll. Maybe they're being paid. Now here, their faith is threatened. Nebuchadnezzar want to compromise their faith that they may begin to pay allegiance to him other than God. These are fallen land. This is not Israel. They are Jewish people. Their commitment to God is not questionable. They have chosen to stand out. I was saying they have chosen to stand out in the midst of this powerful king, Nebuchadnezzar. They said, we are not going to compromise our faith. Throw us in the finance, quite okay. If our God will deliver us, well and good. If we do not deliver us, we will not. So meaning, we are not going to simply relate with God based on his ability to deliver us. Now, even if God will deliver us or not, we will not compromise our faith. We shall trust our God, even right in the furnace, right in the fire. Our faith remains our faith. If your faith cannot stand during the stormy times, during the trying moments, then that is not faith. That's what Peter said. The genuineness of your faith. Shut that mission of being able to prove their faith before the Lord. They could not compromise. They stood firm. You know, Nebuchadnezzar could not just speak. He meant every word that he said. He meant every word. That if we don't worship, then you're going to be cast in the finance of fire. Which, of course, it happened. But what happened? The fourth man appeared. Jesus Christ appeared. And the fire never burnt them. And the Lord was glorified in the land of Babylon. What am I saying? You know, sometimes we go through motions of life and we tend to think that God being with us is because we have these things around us. God deals with us differently, very different. As a Christian, having so much does not confirm that your faith is intact. Neither does having less confirm that your faith is intact. But the point is, when your faith is not attached to these things but to the Lord and the Lord alone then even if these things are taken out of the way that gives us actually comfort then your faith is genuine and in this last day the greatest test that you're going to encounter just as the early church during the days of Apostle Paul Peter and the rest of the disciples went through is the test of our faith that is what's going to be taking place in this last days
the test of it, that gentleness of our faith. That's what is going to be taking place, literally. Very, very important for us to take that to account. In Job chapter number 23. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. But he knows the way that I take. He has concern for it, appreciates, pays attention to it. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as refined gold, pure and luminous. This is Job. Of course, we know what Job was going through. And he would say, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is Job. Job trusted God even in the most difficult moments of his life. His faith was tested, yet he stood firm, never compromised. I pray for all of us as believers and those who sometimes feel their faith is being threatened to remain firm and allow our faith to be tested so that the journeys of your faith can be proved. Christ asked in Luke chapter 18 verse 8, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? on the earth. Will you find faith on the earth? James, on the other hand, James Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Chapter 1 verse 2 Consider the holy joyful my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in all en encountered or encountered trials of sort, of any sort rather, or fall into various temptations, be assured and understand that the trial proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. And let endurance and steadfastness, patience, full have full play. Do thorough work so that you may be a people perfectly and fully developed with no defects lacking in nothing. You see, for us to have that mature faith, that faith that sees no one else but Jesus Christ alone in our lives, that faith that makes God real in our lives, that faith that does not get attached to these other things, then you must go through the trial. And James says, you need to really do what? Consider it holy, joyful. Peter says, count it all joy. In other words, the attitude, the, some of the, you know, one of the things that simply uh, confirm that our faith is genuine is when we are in the difficult moment, we still are able to keep up with our joy, our faith rather. That's the most important thing. Very, very important. to look at First Thessalonians chapter number 5. 
Paul says, be happy in your faith. Rejoice and be glad hearted continually. Always. Be happy in your faith. This is the Amplified Translation. Be happy in your faith. Now, let's look at some of the heroes and heroines of faith, which of course most of us are aware of and what happened to them. Hebrews 11, we read especially from verse number 35. The Bible says, Some women received again their dead by a resurrection. Others were tortured to death with clubs, refusing to accept release offered on the terms of denying their faith. They were willing to defend their faith. That's what we talk about apologetics, you know. They were willing to fight, contend for their faith. That's like Jude says, contend for their faith. So they might be resurrected to a better life. 36. Others had to suffer trial, mocking, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. You see, again, the subject of focus is this faith. This was a moment when these people are going through so many challenging moments. But what was being targeted was their faith. They were stoned to death, they were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. They were sown asunder, they were slaughtered by the sword while they were alive. They had to go about wrapped in the skins of sheep, gods, utterly destitute and oppressed. Men whom the world was not worth roaming over desolate places, mountains, living in caves, caverns and holes of the earth. All these through their uh, all these, though they won divine approval by means of their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised, because God had us in mind, and something better and greater in view, so that they, these heroes and heroines of faith, should not come to perfection, apart from us before we could join them. Now, we are trying to simply remain sub focused on the subject of faith here. These are people that stood firm. Of course, the Bible gives us a reason place that actually He never wanted them to come to perfection without us as they were going through those motions of challenging. Now, if these people are able to go through that, you as a believer, I as a believer, if it so happens that things begin to become tougher in our time, are we going to compromise our faith? Are we going to give in to the demonic antiques? Or are we going to simply say, Lord, I still love you. Whether you bless me or not, I'm going to love you. Whether you make ways for me or not, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to worship you. This is the issue. Many, many believers across the nation of the world be easily given and compromise when tough times show up in their lives. And I'm talking just tough times, not serious issues, tough times. What about persecutions? What about when our lives are threatened? Are we going to denounce our faith? We are being given offers. Denounce your faith and you'll be okay. They said no. We will remain subject to our make. It's very important every believer. I know that those have heard this, that those have grown into this with a blessing. But those who've never been able to take this to heart, it's high time. You take this to her because that testing of our faith is very important and is going to take place and will begin, will continue taking place so that it may be found not as counterfeit but as genuine. You can differentiate a fake form and a genuine form, a genuine product and a fake form. You can easily, when you put them on those machines that simply can simply confirm this gene and this it's very true and for us our faith goes through fire goes through stormy soul seasons so that we realize are we going to stand or are we going to fall paul was killed in rome under nero peter was killed in rome under nero thousands of believers died in rome under nero they never gave up their faith. They died.
Christ in their faith. Are we ready to face this in this era that you're living in? If I may ask this question, how ready are we? You and me, how ready are we? Because difficult moments are going to come. Paul was able to encourage, or rather Peter was able to encourage the believers. If you read at your own time, 1 Peter 4.16, and of course 1 Peter 2.19 and 23, then 1 Peter 3.15 to verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 19, if you take time and read, you will help you will simply realize what Peter said them, how to respond during those difficult moments. They encouraged them, they really spoke to them well, but the fact remains later on, they equally died in Rome. This is very interesting. As a believer, don't just be focused on what God is able to do for you in this life. If God gives us life trouble, we may go through that season of persecutions, seasons, the dark hour. What are you going to do? Are you going to give up? Are you going to let go of your faith? Offers will come. Offers, you'll be told, denounce your faith. And I'll give you this denounce your faith. And you'll have this denounce your faith. A time is going to come when maybe you'll be able to access some things will be quite difficult because as you know very well, Revelation 13 talks about what? That whoever doesn't have the mark of the beast will not be able to buy or sell until you have the mark of the beast. That will be the condition during that time. Revelation 13. If you don't have that mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell. It is here. I'm not just speaking. I'm this after rapture, I suppose. Verse 16 of Revelation 13. Also it compels all alike, both small, great, both the rich and the poor, both free and slave, to be marked with an inscription stamped on their right hand, uh, their right hands and on their forehead, so that no one will have power to buy or sell unless he bears the stamp, the mark inscription, that is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is to say our basic necessity will be disrupted in the event you happen to be alive during that time when the Antichrist will come in full force and you know see how he can be able to take control of the world and control humanity. So for one to simply appear to have paid allegiance to the serpent or to the enemy but will be fast and formal because he knows our basic necessities are very important. That anyone that doesn't have that mark of the beast, they will not access basic necessities. They won't have ability to own even anything. They won't have power to buy or to sell. Now that is the hardest place to be. That's now what I'm talking about, our faith being challenged. Remember the days of Apostle Paul and Peter, 62 AD, 64 AD, 67 AD. They eventually died because Nero said, these people are the ones that have caused fire in this city, in this particular region. So we have to simply get them dying. And they died in thousands. They were massacred. Are we willing to stand strong even in the midst of difficult moments? Are we willing? I'm sharing this for you to just be prepared 
for any eventualities. It may not be necessarily you being killed or something of that sort, but the fact is that moment will come. Our faith will be tested. Even as we speak right now, your faith will be tested in different forms. Will you compromise? Will you stand strong as a believer? Or will you compromise? Will you let go of your faith and choose something that's going to give you temporal comfort as opposed to that is going to simply grant you eternal security? That faith in Christ Jesus. Anyway, I believe that something has got into your spirit. Remember the days you are living in, the sons of Israel understood. And that means they helped Israel to know what is supposed to be done according to the season that they were in. May we also be sensitive in the spirit and administer that which is in line with the season that we are in because we are at the age of time. So much is happening around the world. So much is going on. And the prophetic unfolding is taking place so loudly. So we can't be ignorant. We can't be focused on me, I, myself, me, I, myself. No. We have to be focused on Christ. Our faith must keep growing. Our faith must become more strong. Because you lose your faith, you lose everything. At some point, Paul said, examine yourself if you're still in the faith. Very, very important. May the good Lord give us all the needed grace so that we can remain firm in our faith now and the days ahead. It's really important. May the good Lord give us that grace. I pray for all of us. Pray for that is watching. Don't give up. Don't compromise. Let your faith remain strong in the midst of all difficulties. Your faith is precious. You cannot compare it to gold, silver, or anything. You can't. It is more precious. So don't compromise on it. Don't let go. Don't give up. God bless you and do your good. Let your faith be found genuine, not counterfeit. Remember, anything genuine must go through a test. Even anything fake, for it to be found is fake, must go through testing. If you have your note for your country, whatever country you come from, we have what people that make fake notes and they spread them all over. But we have gadgets that are able to detect this currency or this particular note is fake. It has everything, that's all the details. But when it is tested, going to church is not enough. Cutting your Bible is not enough. When your faith is tested, that's when we actually tell that you're a genuine believer. Your gift is not enough. I'm talking about your faith, is what I'm talking about. When that faith is tested, then the truth is we can simply say, This is a true believer, child of God. But in those days, we're going to go through a moment and a season that may not be quite pleasant. You know, even as we move to the years ahead, you'll see how things are going to happen. Things are going to be more challenging. But as believers, we must go back to enhance our faith in the Lord. Just like the enemy targeted the believers during the days of Nero. And that's the way Nebuchadnezzar targeted Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and even Daniel. The same way, the genuine believers are going to be targeted in these days. Sooner than later, it's going to happen. But the truth is, remain firm, remain strong in your faith. Because the faith you have in Christ Jesus is everything. We have hope beyond the grave. We have been born into an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you. Keep watch of you, the loved ones. 
in the name of Jesus. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Now and the days ahead. May grace be multiplied over your life and your loved ones. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we get towards the new year, in the next coming few days that I hate, may the Lord be with you and your loved ones. In Jesus' name. Amen. And in case you have not been able to subscribe to our channel, kindly one, let me make this plea again. Kindly take a moment, just consider subscribing to our channel.